Hello adventurers and welcome back to my channel. Now music is a part of the fabric of who we are as people and so I always get excited whenever I find a musical place that we can stop off. Today we are stopping off at a really cool place that is a music instrument museum here in Phoenix and it's huge so I can't wait to show you guys what all is here. But I thought before we go inside I want to show you something kind of cool. Do you see this shirt right here? This is a dance till your pants fall off shirt. This is actually a shirt that was brought to me by a friend of mine who has a company called Team Good Humans and you're supposed to be a good human. So I'm gonna leave a link here so you can check out some more cool things that you can do to be a good human. And uh, now we're gonna go inside and dance till our pants come off. Well, maybe not because they, they tend to frown upon that, but you know, it, it's fun. Oh my goodness, this place is huge, like much larger than I had anticipated it even being. And um, this guy might look familiar. This is Aussie Van Man. Of course, before we start off, I went ahead and picked up my patch so that I could have this in the van. Okay guys, I picked up a map and it looks like there are two floors here. Now there are a few rules that you have to follow whenever you come in. You can't bring anything like a tripod or a stick that can be extended, so no monopods. Also, if you do come in with a bag and it does resemble a backpack, you need to wear it as a purse as opposed to a backpack and uh, nothing too large otherwise they'll hold it at the front desk they gave us one of these so there is an audio tour that kind of goes through out and you can push play and then listen and they do give you these and then you return them whenever you're finished with your experience so for the time being I've got my backpack like right here in the front it's actually a purse but um you know they just don't want you to run into anything I totally get that Okay, this is super cool. So you wear the headset and you have this little guy and as you get close to different displays that have screens, it actually plays the music from the instruments that you're seeing. It's really, really cool. Now I can't share that audio with you guys because it doesn't pick up on the camera. However, super, super neat. This place is expansive. They do have special exhibits and right now, the music just turned on as I entered into the guitar section. I'm gonna show you guys what the guitar section looks like and talk to you a little bit about it on the flip side. And as we're kind of moving throughout the gallery, you see each guitar and then there is a little placard by them to tell you a little bit more about them. And I have to say, this one is, is potentially one of my favorites, a clear guitar, but what is this? What is this? Believe it or not, guys, this is actually also an electric guitar. It just doesn't look like anything I have ever seen before. This was made between the 1970s and 1985, and it is just very unique. Of course, in this particular gallery, however, unique seems to be a normal thing. Look at this right here. This is the Smooth Talker SSC2. It's an electric and acoustic guitar made in South Africa in 2007. The details on this are beautiful in the wood grain, as you can see the texture just so so neat this guitar is actually from France around 1815 is whenever it was created and it is a lyre shaped guitar that was popular in Parisian salons in the 1900s and then because we're in Phoenix this one's kind of cool this one is actually themed for the Phoenix Suns and it is an ash and maple guitar that was made in 2001 in Corona California but this guy right here this is interesting this is actually called the voodoo guitar it was made in New Orleans in 2010 it's made of wood metal crystal LED chicken foot. It is a fender and it was actually damaged in Hurricane Katrina but rebuilt and it is now on display here. As always guys, there's tons of different things in each museum that we go to, so I'm only able to scratch the surface just a little bit. But the guitar gallery really brings this into perspective as to what we're expecting to see. All sorts of variety, all sorts of years, many unique things that you won't find anywhere else, and uh, you can come here to Phoenix to check them out. But next to me is something, wow. 
This may just look like a regular pipe organ, but this is actually a pipe organ from 1859. Did you know that the pipe organ is considered to be the king of the instruments because it has a capacity for producing a stunning variety of different sounds? And this one is majestic. Now the cool thing about this one is this is the only surviving model that was made by this particular maker. And so it is here on display for you to see in all its majesty and it is absolutely dynamic and beautiful. It's made out of rosewood and you can see there are tons of pipes. In fact, there are 502 altogether in this particular organ, which is absolutely amazing. So I can only imagine the sounds from this would have been so epic to hear. They just fill the room and kind of bring like an interesting reverberation to your soul. But um, what, what's this? Let's go in there next. orientation's about to start. Let's go check out a little bit of it. It starts in about 30 seconds. It lasts five minutes and it goes off kind of continuously throughout the day. So this is going to kind of give us some context as to the museum and then we'll come back out and check this guy out because it's um it's huge. I just kind of want to show you the size of it in just a minute. This is really cool because it talks about how music is literally the fabric of life and how along the way the development of instruments has made that where people can express themselves and do some really interesting things. It talks about how every culture and every style of music really brings something different to tell the stories of the people who it expresses, who it represents. So that's really cool. Yeah. This is, this is something that you gotta watch, guys. Okay, as we leave the orientation, we come back out and see this guy. This is huge. And you can kind of see a comparison of how tall that Brock is over here versus this. He's at a little bit of a distance, so he looks a little shorter, but for the most part, he would only come up to about here, at the very bottom of the fretboard, if he were standing next to it. And just to kind of give you a little bit more context, this is what it would have looked like to play this. You stand up on the steps, and then this very large instrument would be strummed your person that is um very very tiny in comparison oh wow guys this is interesting i've never seen anything like this this is actually made in thailand in the mid 20th century it was made of bronze wood glass and cow skin and you can see that it is quite impressive looking it was typically played at thai funerals and it was tuned to sound like gongs, kind of. Up top here, we have something pretty familiar to us. We have a drum, but this was actually a military bass drum from 1861. And in this section, you can see a viola that was from 2011 that is actually being played in Paraguay. And you can see the woman who would be playing it and how it would be played. It's very different than most of the violas I've seen, the texture on the top. And then also, as you kind of look behind, it looks very interesting. In fact, as we walk through this gallery, we learn about how the music represents the people and how each culture is represented very similarly to the orientation that we were just in. So in this gallery, you see a variety of different instruments from around the world, which is so fascinating. And again, you pick up on random pieces of music as you pass by screens like these. So it's just this sensory like joy that comes from a place like this. Music brings us so many like things. Anytime you hear a song, it takes you to a place where you first heard that and it's very transformative. So I love to see how all of these different kinds of pieces could factor into that overall story. But there's so much more to this place. So we're off to our next location. Because there are two levels, we decided to come up and then go down. You can see below us the orientation area and some more of these amazing instruments. These are quite large and they're suspended in unique ways. Now there are a few here that are just really super crazy impressive, but as soon as we got off the escalator, there's this guy. I'm really curious to see what exactly the story behind him is, so let's go check it out. 
It's actually kind of an interesting story. In the back you can see the village and then you can see this guy. And it says one of the most important traditions was the initiation of the boys into adulthood, which included participation of mass characters. And that's what this guy would be. And here they would present a variety of different drums. And it was very interesting to read a little bit more about this down here. It talks about the ceremony itself and then also kind of what you could expect to see. But the actual detail on this particular suit is fabulous. You can see this is definitely one that has been worn. There are slight frays in it kind of along and throughout, but there's so many little details that are just beautiful details. And then beside him, there is one of the symbolic drums that would have been used at this time, which is really cool. We are now going to be entering into the Africa and Middle East gallery. You can see the continents and countries for which this will cover. And inside this large door, we have a lot of surprises in store. And when I say a lot, I mean a lot. Like, just, just kind of breeze through this. Look at this, so much. Each area has the name of the country above. They each have a TV screen. And so as you get closer, you can hear what the sounds of that country might be, including some of their ceremonial songs, some of their leisurely songs, and, and more. We're starting off here at Camp Verde, and you can see a variety of different instruments. One of my favorite things about this particular section is you can see the use of the shells as a part of some of the things that they use. Again, you can find the video here and also a written text about the country and the music and what kind of like resources that they use for their music, which is pretty cool. Each one of these, so unique. So, so unique. And then you can also find some of their traditional attire as well, which is very neat as we kind of move from Camp Verde into Mali right here. And one of the interesting things that I just learned is Malayan instruments are actually known more globally thanks to the styles of popular music, which have integrated in many of their pieces into the sounds that we hear even today. As we move into Senegal and Gambia, we learn that they share not only borders, but also many of the same people and musical instruments. And it's, these are more of the traditional instruments that we might find. Now, you might notice the materials that they're using on these are sourced from the things around them. So for example, this one right here has a snake skin that would be the outer portion of it. There's also a lot of other really unique, interesting pieces that are used that could be sourced from the nature around. And when you see this, you might think drum, but would you think drum when you see these massive things behind us? These are actually from the Ivory Coast. When you come to this section, everything is bright and colorful and vibrant. And as you watch the video that is attached, even the cultural outfits, bright, vibrant, colorful, absolutely amazing and beautiful. And again, a lot of drums in this culture as well. And I think that that's one of the more interesting things that we're finding from this section is the driving beat of the drums really can translate a lot of different ways as you go from culture to culture. In the Nigerian section, we have drums that have small bells on them, lots of vibrant patterns and colors once again. And the details in some of these drums, just such vibrant, beautiful pictures of the people that they represent. As we check out Cameroon, the beadwork here is impressive to say the least, tiny intricate details. But then as you move back and check out their drums, you also see intricate carvings and designs, patterns. This section is especially interesting because for the first time we've moved away from just the drum beats and we've moved into more of a Spanish style guitar. And the flutes make a very like, dancing kind of sound. It's very interesting to see the combination of these different musical instruments together in this context, being able to listen to what's going on on the screen.
as we move into the Israel section, the music also takes a different turn. It's very interesting to again hear the music that is being provided for us. You can see the stringed instruments as well as the use of the horns that would have been native to that area. And then you even have the stringed instruments which could be strummed as well here. There are also some woodwinds and as we move through here we start to get more into the more traditional what we see now instruments with the violin, the clarinet, things like that. This guy right here is possibly one of the more interesting looking instruments I've stumbled across. You can see here it's made out of mulberry wood, camel bone, and lamb skin. It's called a tar, and this one was actually from 2010. It's kind of interesting looking, but this is the theme of the instruments in this particular section, including the sitars right here as well, also made out of mulberry wood, camel bone, and brass. Now this is from Iran, and it's kind of interesting to see because a lot of times when you think of a sitar, you, you hear the noise, you hear what it makes as the sound. However, you don't know how it is making that sound. So here you can see them playing. It can either be strummed or it can be played with a bow of sorts, which is kind of interesting. And so being able to sit here and hear that, it's just beautiful. Now, I really enjoy the music of Nora Jones. I learned that Nora Jones' father was a sitar player. And I just thought that that was so cool because it's such a unique sounding instrument and it takes a lot of skill and talent. So I was very excited to see them here. Now, we just learned that near the end of the Ottoman Empire, in 1918, the Kurdish people saw that their homeland was divided amongst nations of Turkey, Iran, Iraq, and Syria, but they shared traditional sounds, and they still do to this day, including their dancing styles. And here you can find a little bit more about how all of those cultures blend together through this particular section of instruments and videos. This is made of wood and mother of pearl, and you can see the intricate designs over the base here as you go down the strings themselves. This was actually one of the highlighted pieces here at the museum, and it is because it was actually owned and played by a celebrated composer, Simon Shanahan. Wow, the details just keep going, guys. Now, Turkey is actually broken up into several sections. So we have ceremonial here, and then countryside, and then Sufi, down here by Brock and then urban and in each one of these sections it talks about the differentiation in different kinds of music and the instruments that they would play accordingly and here you can find everything from like military drums and parade drums to native horns flutes and other items which is kind of interesting not to mention you can find some of the traditional attire in this section as well and as you walk through each one of these it picks up on the individual sounds as you pass by that television so you can hear the context of the musical instruments right around it perhaps one of the cooler things about this museum is not only does it differentiate the different countries and where each instrument comes from but also what it sounds like because a lot of us might not be is familiar with some of these that are from not the United States and so it's really cool to see how you can hear that sound and say huh I've heard that before I just didn't know it was that kind of instrument then you can make that muscle memory music memory so that next time that you hear it you'll identify that exact instrument and have a visual of who's playing how they're playing and um, what makes it do kind of what it does now in this section called cultural aesthetics we learned that the ornate details that they use a lot of times in their textiles is a representation also of their music and it's closely linked in broader sense of overall aesthetic you'll find things that just kind of make sense whenever you look at the imagery of the actual instrument versus the attire and that's kind of cool we are now moving into the asia area and another expansive gallery and it looks like they're actually working on a little bit of this gallery also which is pretty cool again expansive huge i'm just going to touch on a few of the unique things that you can find here and as we go through there's some very interesting pieces as soon as we come in the door we start off in kyrgyzstan and this is called a puppet box and it was made out of beech wood and then also goat skin and plastic it is a 
marionette style and actually as it's being played these goats move and do different things it's kind of cool and um, again on the screen they have a representation of what it looks like so if you stick around long enough to hear each one of the different things you'll see this thing in action Turkmenistan Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan alike there are a lot more strummable instruments here and you can see how each one of them sounds a little bit different you can also see how many of these strummable instruments again could be used by hand or with a bow which is very interesting interesting. A lot of mulberry is used in the creation of these. In addition to the televisions, you also have photos showing you how these would be used and also the proper attire for which they would probably be wearing at that time. Along the Silk Road, we find yet another use of a snakeskin here, and this is an interesting tool to say the least. It's basically two strings that come down a very large neck with two adjustments at the end and then there is a little base that you can strum with a horse hair or some form of hair bow right here. And then we make it here. This is beautiful. It's just so beautiful. The detail work on some of these instruments is amazing. Now the Silk Road was known as one of the main trade routes. So along this way, you will find a lot of different things that are absolutely spectacular that would have been used to not only celebrate the times, to provide music, but also that could be used as trade. So some of these are more intricate designs like this one where you can see a full scene or this one where the fretboard has different carved designs. Mongolia introduces us to more vibrant, bright colors. This is actually a Shava. Mongolian people would use this Buddhist mask to um, herald new life and bring fertility to people's herds. This is considered to be a bowed lute. There are a lot of lutes in this museum. It is a traditional style of instrument. This one has two different strings on it. And as you can see, a very elaborately painted like base to it. As you move upward though, this, this really is impressive. It's gorgeous. The artwork is amazing. These two costumes provided are performance costumes from the Mongolian people. This one is made of nylon and cotton. This one is silk and cotton. And you can also see that they have some of their instruments here. This is a plucked lute and this one is a bowed spiked lute. And again, referencing the photos on the bottom, you can see how this would have been played and the attire that would have been worn. We have now moved into the China area. Area, and they have singing bowls. Now you can still find singing bowls at a lot of different places and they're very much so something that I vastly appreciate the sound of. They're just very calming. But the original purpose of these bowls was to create a mysterious and um, interesting sound. They create three notes using three bowls and you can use them in a variety of ways to either echo, reverberate, or make a continuous like climbing sound. Now of course China is huge and within China are several different additional areas. So this was specifically from the Tibetan area, but there's some more here that I'm really fascinated by that I want to show you a little bit more of. There are these massive pieces right here that are probably some of the larger instruments I've seen thus far. Now these are actually from the 20th century. They're made of copper, brass, and <laughs> silk, and they were played by Buddhist monks for rituals. They also collapse like a telescope when they're not in use. So even though they're huge right now, they could actually collapse down into one of these sections right here. Again, the section for South Korea has both folk and then court and ritual music. So there are different kinds of instruments that would be used for different things. And here you can find some of the performance art that's actually done still using these instruments to this day, which is absolutely beautiful. Folk music in South Korea has many variations that are played throughout different portions of the country. So this section really reflects the different 
portions of music that would be played. Something that's super common throughout both of these sections, however, are these instruments right here. We also saw these in the Silk Road section. It's just very large versions. This is a double-headed barrel drum from the 1950s using wood, animal skin, brass, and pigments. It is called a dragon drum and it's played in court ensembles and military processions. There is also a traditional court death costume here that is made out of various textiles and it was worn in a performance to greet the new spring. Now what we're looking at behind us, I actually have seen a version of it in the Smithsonian and there was a very large display talking about these bells. There was a lot of information out there about these bells and their symbolism and also the sounds that they make and how it resonates with different tones within different people. It's really fascinating but um this one is spectacular. It's beautiful. I have to show you closer. Now this particular rack was created in 2009 and it's made of bronze and wood and it was acquired by the museum actually to honor someone. So that's pretty cool also. But you can see the vibrant colors, the intricate designs, the carvings, the woodwork, and um, we learn a little bit more about this just below where we find out that spectacular racks of bronze bells and jade chimes were used as a part of the musical philosophy of the Korean Empire. Again, reflecting on what this would look like in its practical use right here. Huge drum, so huge. But not only is it huge, the outer painting shows eight painted lions that symbolize the eight enlightened ones of Buddhism. Now this is a Singapore lion dancing costume and it was actually created by the Chinese people in the early 21st century using textiles, wood, plastic, artificial fur, and feathers. And it is worn by two dancers and it looks like this whenever in use. Notice that the eyelids can actually blink, the mouth can open, and uh, all of the portions of the body can move as the people inside of this create the illusion of the dancing lion. The Japanese section is filled with intrigue as you hear the constant slow beat of the drum, the flute, and the interesting small pieces of bells in the background. I really enjoy that this section right here looks like a traditional Japanese home and you can see the bamboo that is fashioned into a very interesting woodwind instrument right here. Oh wow, this is amazing. This is so amazing. You can see on the back screen they have a full almost puppetry performance that is using shadows and these are the figures that they're using on the screen right here. That's really cool. Now on these particular stories they would tell stories that were meant to teach a lesson and also tell the stories of the heroes of their culture which is really neat and they would use various instruments to bring about the changing of the scene or add drama and to really pull you in in a way that's unlike anything else I've seen this is a very very neat stop take some time there listen to it make sure you read the signs on this one because it tells you more about the individual puppets very cool oh my goodness this is a 10 foot drum and it's called a cannon drum. A lot of times it is mounted on a wheeled cart for transportation and it's played at celebrations in Thailand. As we move into ancient Vietnam, we find a lot of bronze and the bronze of course has aged over time with this patina. It's actually pretty interesting to see up close though, the designs. For example, this drum is from 200 BCE and it's from Northern Vietnam. It says that the bronze drums were played at rituals and they depicted iconography on the drums themselves. Now, of course, because it's a little harder to see that from the distance that we are from the drum, this is what they look like up close. And you can see again, Every single scene is symbolic of a story. Music truly is the fabric of who we are. And so by seeing these different cultures and the experiences that they're having and the stories that they're telling to pass on from generation to generation, you get to see that a lot more vividly. It's not just, oh, I heard this song and it brought me back to the place. It was, hey, we're continuing to tell our history through these things, which is absolutely fabulous. But um, there's a little bit more history to be told as we continue to move through these galleries. Gongs might be created in a place no different than this. In fact, on the wall behind, you can see how they're creating some of the iconic gongs that are symbolic to so many different cultures. And as we bid farewell to Asia, we move into Latin America. 
And we start off here in Peru with what is called the scissor dance. The scissor dance is the long-standing tradition of the Peruvian Andes, including their ritual for battle, endurance between two specialists who perform acrobatic feats. Now the Peruvian instruments are quite interesting. You see a lot more of the woodwind instruments using different kinds of bamboo here. You also see a lot more of the interesting things like this, which would have been worn or shaken and you can see it's called the leg rattle. These were made of fruit seed shells and those were actually from the 1980s. Now Peru also introduces us to many of the brass instruments which we start seeing. These are actually silver plated brass right here and you'll notice through many of the Latin cultures that they integrate a lot of different sounds into their music and by using something like this and then also something like this you get some very interesting sounds. We also have the privilege of looking at the ancient Andes and here you can find some of the earliest instruments of the time for these sections of the country and here you find like rattles from one to two hundred and those are pretty neat they're they're patina just like the ones from Vietnam that were older but then as we kind of move through you can learn about the different kinds of instruments and see how various ones would have been played as well again a lot more woodwinds in this particular section something that becomes very clear clear very quickly when you move through the Latin American section is there are a lot more guitar style instruments. Before we had a lot more pluckables that were smaller but these are starting to resemble more and more of what we think of when we think of a guitar and so that's why you're having a lot different sound to the Latin music than you did to the Asian music or into the Middle Eastern music. It's just a different style with different instruments and um, very fascinating. When we get to Paraguay we actually have another highlighted instrument and this one is very cool. It's a harp that is a framed harp. It's made of cedar and spruce and it was once actually the property of a Paraguayan authoritarian president who was deposed in 1989. He ordered this for his daughter. In Colombia we actually find these two small ceramic items that are very neat. These were created between 900 and 1500. A very different kind of drum right here. These are actually made from tortoise shells. These are from Belize and they are from the late 20th century. Of course, we enter Mexico, which is our neighbor to the south, and we find a section for festival dances and mariachi, in addition to regional and guitar. So here you can find costumes, popular instruments that are used, and hear the unique sounds that sound like celebration. And who hasn't heard of Carnival? and Brazil. We have made it to the Brazilian section and this is a vibrant, exciting, happy time right here. You can see what looks like the sounds of celebration through the drums and you can envision all of the sounds of carnival. There is a really nice impressive section of ukuleles here and you can find variety of sizes, styles, and years. In fact, this one right here that has a heart is from 1936 and comes directly from Hawaii. Sir, I found your country. What, America? No, your original country. <laughs> we have found Australia. Now, tell me, sir, of these instruments, have you played any of these? I have unsuccessfully played a didgeridoo. Clapsticks are pretty simple. Um, boomerangs, yeah, play those. Uh, guitar we have over there. But the dulcimers I've never played, actually. and. Mandolin, haven't played that before. We move into New Zealand, I feel as though this is probably some of the more elaborately carved flutes that we've seen. In fact, this entire section you can find lots of detail work. These are really impressive. As you all have guessed, we are no longer in Latin America. We are now in Oceania, and here we have Hawaii. So we have several traditional Hawaiian instruments and then also Polynesia and in Polynesia I really wanted to stop here because of these 
these look like hollowed out logs, but they're called slit drums. And you can see that they have a tool for which that they would hit these to make different sounds and it would make a hollow sound, which is pretty cool. Of course, in Polynesia, they do use the shell trumpet using these conch shells. Here we see Vanuatu and um, Brock was just telling me this is actually a popular vacation place for Australians, so that's kind of cool, but I was more impressed by these. These things are mammoth. They're probably 10 feet tall. And again, these are slit drums. They look like they are hollowed out trees. And then you can see there is a support pole on the inside, probably just for structure here. But the carving is so impressive. We've been seeing an ongoing theme of snakes, and I, I don't love snakes, but I, I do appreciate that they're using each piece of different things things for stuff. This is actually kind of interesting. The drum itself is made of wood, cow skin, and cord. And then they have rattlesnake tails, which give it an additional sound on top. This section is filled with life. And if you're listening to the music as you go, Cuba really will get you going. You can see here that they have a traditional set of instruments here, but also the vibrance and life of all of the Cuban music. You can see the smiling faces, the Cuban records kind of scattered throughout, and you can hear the variety of different tones that are coming through as you're walking around. It's pretty interesting to see these super elaborate pieces like these or even the costume work here, but then also to see the more traditional looking things that we're more familiar with also. Believe it or not, this is actually from Puerto Rico and it is made out of newspaper, paste, paint, and polyester metal for the mask. And then um, the costume itself is made out of a variety of different kinds of materials as well. Believe it or not, this guy's supposed to be portraying a mischievous character who kind of goes around during festivals. And um, it's, it's become one of the most beloved and most noted symbols in Puerto Rico during their festivals. This is fascinating. It's just outside of the Latin gallery and this is called the Tree of Life. And it actually illustrates the role of music in Mexican life. It's pretty neat. Well, since Brock was saying we found his country, we're now going to the United States and Canada. Are you ready? Now here we will learn about the things that we're already kind of familiar with, but we'll also learn about Native American music and the different people who have, you know, had pieces of our continent at certain points in time. Some of the interesting things that um, we might take for granted here, but we're not gonna take for granted today because we're gonna go check it all out. We start off with the powwow, and the powwow has become deeply connected within the Native American culture since its inception. Here you will find some intricate dance regalia, some of the big drums that would be used at a powwow, and this is all kind of interesting to see, but also this right here. This is actually a champion thing that it talks a little bit more about as you kind of move throughout the various signs. So this is the first thing that you see, and I think this is a great way for us to start off. We follow that with a huge totem pole. This is a very impressive piece from 2017. This actually was from the northwest coast of Canada. Now, as we move through all of our First Nation people, it is divided up into sections. So we have plains, northeast and southeast. We have Arctic and subarctic, and also the northwest coast over here. This one's from pretty close to home for me. This is from the Creek people in Oklahoma. These were from 1985. These are called ankle rattles. This is a mask that was worn by the King Island Inuit people and they are from Anchorage, Alaska. This was fashioned in 2009. Here you can see the depiction of a raven mask being worn and as you watch you can also look over and see just the sheer size of what this mask would actually look like. It's quite large. It would be very heavy and it is a ceremonial mask that has been worn in the Canadian areas. Of course because we are in Arizona it would almost be a crime not to talk about the Southwest. So here we have some of the Southwest drums that would have been used. Here we have some varying aged flutes, like this one right here from the Pueblo people of New Mexico from the 1900s to 1925. Then we have rattles from the 20th century. Here we have a rasp and gourd, which
which is actually made out of a plant. This is a real life plant, guys. <laughs> and this is from the 20th century also. In addition, there is a special section for Arizona instrument makers right here. And you can see some of the craftsmanship from right here in the Arizona area. But then you can also listen to some of the interviews by some of the crafters. Now, just past this section, there is a section that has more like pop culture and some of the interesting people and also places. So we're gonna scan through these and um, kind of show you as many as I can. There's a lot here, guys. Leave yourself like three or four hours for this one at least. I only allotted myself two and it was not enough time. Of course, with any music museum, you need to focus on some of the really cool styles that have been developed, and Memphis is the scene for a lot of blues. In fact, Beale Street is the home of the blues and has had the likes of such people as B.B. King. So here you can find some of the instruments familiar to the Memphis scene of blues. Of course, Memphis is known for the blues and also rock and roll, and you can actually still go visit many of the popular sites and see some of the relics of the past while also in the Memphis area. So this is just a little taste of maybe a future adventure right here. Now something else kind of cool is around the entire gallery here we have various marching band costumes from the Arizona area also because after all that is the music of our stadiums. When we think of modern music we think of electric guitars a lot of times and here you can find a variety of not only electric guitars but some of the amazing people behind them. There's actually a few clips of Jimi Hendrix over here and some of the other big guys but um, as you go around you can find the history of these as well. Country music was a fusion of a lot of different inspirations and it has become one of the most popular genres. Here you can find some of the greats, see some of the instruments that they played, and some of these are, are interesting like this guy right here who was highlighted. In fact, a closer look, this was actually owned and played by Roy Acuff. And this guy right here, this was actually a personal instrument of first-rate steel guitarist Noel Boggs who played in such bands as Hank Penny, Bob Wills, and Spade Cooley. You almost can't have country music without the nudie suits, so of course they have one here. This was Hank Thompson's, and he owned this between the 60s and 70s. This guitar right here is made by Sheridan of Kalamazoo, Michigan in 1965, and it was used by Leon Rhodes, who was the lead guitarist for Ernest Tubb. And then from 1996, this is Kicksbrook's stage outfit, and you can see here that this is a guitar that is very similar to the ones that he would have played right here. Okay guys, this is actually one that I really am familiar with. This is Tim Alexander of Primus. These were his drums. He actually played these while he was headlining Lollapalooza in 1993. In the early 1980s, a new genre emerged and it was called hip hop. And here we have a section with some really cool stuff in it. In fact, you can see some of the most popular creators on these screens. And as you come up, it's songs that will definitely resonate with you. But this particular turntable right here was actually owned and played by pioneering turntablist DJ Kubert. Now jazz starts out with early jazz in this section and works its way across until you get to more modern jazz. Now, if you enjoy jazz, you know there's a lot of difference in this genre from place to place and um, from style to style and even artist to artist. But this right here is one that we can all agree upon. This was a coronet that was owned by Louis Armstrong's teacher. He actually was the teacher of the man that we all know and love today. Inside this case, you will find an ebony wood and nickel silver clarinet that was produced in 1967 and played by Benny Goodman during the latter part of his career. These are pretty spectacular. These are custom fingerboards that were made in 2017. This is from a place called Pearl Works, and there's actually an entire section here where you can learn a little bit more about what it is that they do and their level of customization. Moving back to the blues, look at all of these harmonicas. This is amazing. In fact, this entire display is filled with signed harmonicas and the traveling blues musician Falcone began collecting all of these in the 1980s and 20 years later he completed this art collage that is dedicated to all of the legends of blues. If you've seen guitars, you've seen a Martin. Martins are a staple within the industry and here you learn a little bit more about their creation and the family who has worked for six generations to create some of the most iconic instruments 
in the United States. I will say this is my favorite one. It's a leather guitar cover and uh, it's from Franklin, Tennessee. It was modeled in 2008 and it resembled a hand-tooled cover that Elvis Presley commissioned. It's pretty neat. Now, a lot of people today enjoy EDM music, but did you know that EDM started well before it was actually popularized in modern day? In fact, the emergence of electronic instruments began in the 20th century. You can see here long before the EDM that we know, this guy right here, right here, 1958, is actually participating in electronic music using synthesizers. Believe it or not, the glasses that you see before you are musical instruments, in fact, you can see a demonstration of how they are played right here. It's called a grand harmonicon. Parlor music became extremely popular there in the mid 19th century. And here you can find a series of parlor pianos, grand pianos, baby grands. There are so many gorgeous intricate details on these. And speaking of the pianos here, you can see how they are in fact constructed. This is the Steinway section. Now, believe it or not, guys, there's actually a science section to this museum. It talks about how science brings music to life. And in each one of these sections, it talks a little bit more about an aspect of music that you might not think about. For example, the vibrations. It talks to you about what's pleasing and not pleasing for the ear. And as you go through each of these instruments, each of these creates a unique sound that factors into hitting the right notes, which shows you how each note is hit and hit correctly. And then here, technology and innovation talks about how it is all brought together using frequency and also pitch. Now, additionally with this, you can also come into this section and find out about safe listening time to music and also decibel levels, what is safe and what is not. And as you come through this, this is a great educational section to learn a little bit more about how the ear works and then also how music resonates within the ears. We just left the United States and Canada and have entered into Europe. Now, I'm gonna do something. I'm going to leave this as a challenge for you guys. I want you to come see the European Gallery. Tell me what you think about it and share with me what your favorite things that you found here are because there's just so much, guys. Downstairs, we are now going to enter the Artist Gallery. Here it dives into a lot more artists and the first one I see is Dolly, so I know we're on the right track. This is about the CMA Awards and you can find some of the most iconic things in this gallery. So this is gonna be a fun one. Like here we start off with Maroon 5, a more modern band. And here you can find not only performances by Maroon 5, but also some of the various instruments that they have used. This is awesome, look at this. This is an Ibanez Gym 20th anniversary from 2007 right here. It has LED lights inside of it also, which is super cool. Tito Puente right here, the Mambo King's jacket in the back, and then these very cool decorative drums, very super cool. Again, another amazing artist, John Denver. You can find some of his iconic music, but also this guitar. Denver actually composed this old guitar after he was reunited with this particular guitar. This bright pink, amazing, suit dress top is actually one that was worn by Roberta Flack and here you can find not only this but also a piano that is similar to the one that she used the Martin D28 featured here was actually played in Elvis's final live performance in 1977. Additionally, you can find his Golden Globe Award from 1973. In fact, this entire section here is all Elvis. Legendary jazz guitarist George Benson is featured here, and there are some of his collectible items in addition to some autographed items. But then you can find the Johnny Smith electric guitar here that's actually on loan from Benson himself. Roy Orbison and Orbison Enterprises has actually put some things on loan here as well including this ES335 dot electric guitar which was developed in 1989.
85 and was used by Orbison at the Black and White Night in 1988. Now last year guys I had the honor of being able to see the Whalers in concert with Julian Marley, Bob's son, and here you can actually find several different pieces that are on loan from the Museum of Pop Culture in Seattle. And this is the Kent electric bass guitar that was made in Japan between 1967 and 1968. And uh, when reggae first emerged, this guy right here um, was actually part of the scene. If you enjoy music, you've probably heard of the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band before. And they began as a jug band in the 1960s, and they were fueling the country rock music movement for many years. And then there's Woodstock. You can't have Woodstock without some of these iconic pieces, including this stage shoot that was actually worn by Roger Daltrey of The Who. And next to that, we have some of the Who's drum pieces. Additionally, in this section, you'll find Doug Clifford. You'll also find Joan Baez and Carlos Santana, all icons. It is only a good way for us to wrap up this gallery by stopping off at Johnny Cash and the Carter family. This is actually a piece that was on loan that was played by Johnny Cash and his family and friends at the Cash home. Now, it's a beautiful piece, but right next to it, you'll also see the man in black himself Himself had this particular suit and this suit was a stage suit that was worn for numerous performances whoa what is this this is epic this is amazing in fact this piece weighs over two tons and it's over 25 feet long and it is considered to be a dance organ that was manufactured in 1926 in this gallery, we find all sorts of different kinds of players and what we would have listened to music on throughout the ages. And there's also something very similar to um, upstairs where you have just like this random thing that is very interesting. This is a masked seller mechanical doll and the head and limbs, even the tongue moves when it is automated to the music. Now it does walk us through a series of time as you move from one kind of media to the next through Nickelodeon and paper rolls, then discs, and it just goes on and on. In fact, in the Mechanical Music Gallery, this is my favorite piece. It is absolutely gorgeous, and you can see the hand painting is so elaborate. In fact, a variety of hand-cranked organs in many shapes and sizes were specifically made for outdoor performances in Amsterdam that were very similar to this. Now, they do have a very interesting gallery here that you can look into. It is a lab where they work on the different instruments, and when they're at work, you can actually see them moving around doing things and you can see how things are put together and it's really cool but it's right across from the experience gallery so let's dive in there real quick and when I mean real quick I mean like they're gonna close pretty soon but this is the interactive area that you can definitely play with stuff so they do have a hand sanitizer right here so uh yeah definitely wash your hands now in addition to being able to see each one of these there is an area that you can interact with each of them, which is super cool. And as you can see, there's a variety of different kinds and styles of instruments throughout the different span of the countries. Very, very neat. Ooh, yes, we need to do this. Let's see what we can make this sound like. Okay, so in the background you can see, this is like a xylophone. So we have our... And back here we have rain sticks and shakeable things and these little frogs, which I kind of have a cool story about these little frogs. Let me, let me do one of them for you. These are really fun. So... It's like a rhythm instrument. I remember this because my grandma used to have one that my aunt brought her and it was just so cool. So I really get excited when I see them. Oh, but wait, there is a gong. Let's do the gong. Ooh, this is very weighty. Here we go, ready? Good afternoon. The time is- I think that experience is a great way for us to wrap it up. It is five o'clock now and they close every day at five. So we got to get out of here. This was so fun. I had no idea there were this many musical instruments. Every single one of them just like seemed to outdo the next one. Every gallery was so like ornate and the way that they have it divided up, it shows you a clear path of understanding what's out there in the world basically. It was really, really cool. But with that said, it's time for us to go return this and um, get out to the van and off to our next adventure.
Okay, we returned our headset and everything. The cost today was $20. It was absolutely amazing. Again, give yourself a little bit more time. And also check their schedule because they actually have a music hall here where they do live performances. I would love to come back to do one of those. I think it would just be so amazing to experience that in such a cool, unique place. I definitely was happy with this stop and I definitely encourage you guys to do the same at some point. Remember guys, we're not here for a long time, but we are here for a good time. Places like this make it super easy. Music stimulates every part of our being. And I think you guys will not be disappointed if you come. Till next time guys, bye.